gray hair is not a sign of old age, just high mileage. Remember that. <laughs> good morning. It's good to see everybody this morning. We're going to continue our sermon series that we began at the, uh, the beginning of this month, uh, Risen. And um, like I said before, next week we won't have um, that sermon series preached. Uh, Emery will be filling in, and then after that we'll finish that up. Um, but uh, we're um, getting close to the end of that. We're at this time of the year where we're talking about the resurrection of Jesus and uh, spending some time this particular year thinking about how that resurrection affects our uh, present life. And so we're going to continue that this morning. And I, as we do, I want you to think about this question. Uh, just kind of think about this question for a minute. What, what do you believe... What do you believe that you can either have or do that would make your life complete? What is it in your life that if you had or if you did would make that life of yours complete? And so just kind of some ideas of, of some answers that you might give. You might think about a relationship if you're younger and you're entering into a new relationship and you think, you know... If, if I am married to this person, that would make my life complete. And so for somebody who is younger, you might think, well, that, or, you know, older, all right, all right I'll give you that, different ages, uh, different uh, walks of life there, but um, this kind of concept of having a particular somebody in your life that's going to make your life complete, or maybe, maybe it's something, you might have a, an object in mind uh, that you might think, you know, if I had that, I would just, that would be it. I mean, my life would be complete. Or maybe if I went somewhere, or maybe if I had that job, or whatever it might be, there are a number of things that we can kind of talk about and come up with that we can, we can think about that, that we believe personally would be fulfilling, that it would make our life complete. But whatever it is for you, now, I want you to think about this. How is the pursuit of that one thing affecting you right now? How is it affecting you? How is the pursuit of that one thing changing your, your thoughts, altering your decisions, controlling your life? How is that one thing, that pursuit of that one thing, changing your current life? So as you, as you think about that, um, I, I've kind of meshed this into this idea of, of what the church in Colossae was going through. It's not a perfect um, uh, coupling, uh, but uh, nonetheless, it is similar to what they were struggling with, but I think it's very applicable to us to think about these things. But the church in Colossae was struggling with this idea that, um, that Christ was not enough for them. And that was the struggle, that somebody was coming in and telling them that, that their relationship to Christ, that they had, is not enough. And that they needed to add to that relationship. And so they would, they would probably say, Christ plus, you know, Christ plus these rules would make you complete. That relationship with God would be complete. Your life would be complete if you had Christ plus. Or, or Christ plus. Plus, and for these brethren, it was the struggle of, of uh, circumcision, which seemed to be the, the prominent teaching of the time. If, if only the, the, um, the brotherhood were circumcised, then it would be Christ plus, and that would make you complete. Your relationship with God would be complete, or pr Christ plus knowledge. That was a big one, to say, you know, if you, if you had Christ plus this information, then, then you're complete, then you're, you're fulfilled in God, and that relationship is complete. Um, but in order to have completion, in order to have fullness in your relationship, they wanted you to believe, or they wanted these, these brethren in Colossae to believe that they needed something more, something else to fulfill that, that void and to, to bring them up to speed. So if you have your Bibles and you want to turn to Colossians chapter 2, it will be on the screen, uh, but you're welcome to follow along. Colossians chapter 2, we're going to be starting in verse 1. And Paul says, uh, for, for I want you to know how great a struggle I have on your behalf, and for those who are at Laodicea, and for all those who have not personally seen my face, that their hearts may be encouraged, having been knitted together in love, and attaining to 
all the way comes from the full assurance of understanding, resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery, that is, Christ himself. And then he says in verse 3, in whom all are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So, so Paul wants wants to reassure the brethren, that's what he's doing here, to reassure them that the message that they've received, the information that they have received about Jesus, about who he is and and how he relates to the salvation of the human family, that all that they have received in Christ Jesus is enough. That, That the fullness of Christ, the fullness of all the wealth, all the treasure that is found in him is is enough to make them complete in their relationship to God. And and when people, and I think this is true with us too, when when we are uncertain that we, we have enough or we've done enough or we know enough, that that uncertainty creates within our hearts doubt. That we think, well, you know, um, that person has has been teaching me and talking to me at home, and 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 they've been trying to encourage me to believe this thing, you know, and 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 they really think that I need to to do this, or I need to believe this, or I need to think this, or or whatever the case may be, because that's what was going on in Colossae. There were teachers coming in, and they were telling them that you need this portion of the law of Moses, or you need this practice, or you need this tradition, or you need this ritual. And, and they, were, they were doubtful of their relationship to God because somebody had put this seed of doubt in their mind that they needed more than Christ Jesus to have a relationship with God. And of course, they're struggling. They weren't certain they were on the right path because somebody has come along and put doubt in their mind. They weren't certain that they were on the path that leads to God, the righteousness, because somebody has come along and put false information in their hearts. And so I was thinking about getting lost. You ever been lost? You ever been driving somewhere or it's somewhere and you and you're just like, I have no earthly idea where I'm at. You know, and you're driving along and you know your GPS just doesn't seem to work. Of course, you know, maybe you don't have a GPS and you're just completely out of sorts. You don't know where you're going. And, and then that sense, that moment of time when you just think, I don't know what to do. You know, I mean, I don't know where to go. I don't know where to turn. I can't just keep driving because I'm gonna get even more lost. I've got to do something, I've got to find information. And, and, and think about somebody coming in and, and giving you information. And even when they do, you're, you're grateful, but you're kind of thinking, oh, I sure hope they know where they're taking me, <laughs> because I sure don't know. And so even, even when people come in and give information, you have this little bit of you know, distrust in the information, and you think, well, I don't know. You know, I mean, I may get even more lost, or I don't know if that person really knows what they're talking about. And, and so... You, you have this, this sense of, of discomfort and just not knowing. And, and I think when, when you do know, right, if you know where you're going and you're familiar with the place and you, you trust the source of your information, there, there is an extreme sense of, of comfort in knowing, isn't there? And that's true with our Christian walk too, isn't it? There, there is an extreme sense of comfort that when you know that the source is good and the information is good and you have the right knowledge, you have the right source, and when you know, you know. And there's a sense of comfort that is, that is hard to describe it. It's overwhelming. But then, but then when you, you realize you don't have the right information or you've been misled or you've given, been given the wrong direction, ah, that is distressful. And that's what the brethren are going through. They're going through a sense of distress. And Paul wants to encourage them and say, no, no, you have the right information. You have received it from the right source. You have done what you were called to do. Don't let somebody come in and put that seed of doubt in your mind as if you have not. In verse 4, 
He says, I say this so that no one, Paul says, no one will delude you with persuasive argument. For even, even though I am absent in the body, nevertheless, I am with you in the spirit, rejoicing to see your good discipline and the stability of your faith in Christ Jesus. Right? Seeds of doubt, false information that will, that will cause them to doubt and reconsider what they have already been taught. And Paul says these arguments are not just out of the question, completely out of left field kind of arguments, but he says these are persuasive. And they're persuasive enough to cause you to ask questions. To say, you know, what they're saying makes sense. What they're saying makes sense, and, and I need to consider it, and I need to think about it, and, and maybe they're right, and, and maybe Paul's wrong. Maybe Paul didn't give me all the information I needed. Maybe Paul doesn't know. Maybe this is something Paul hasn't heard before, and, and, and maybe these people know, and, and I need to listen to them, and that, that moment when you just have to stop and think, wait a second, am I on the right path? You see, Paul deals with this also with the church in Galatia. It's a little different context, but it's a similar struggle. And, and he speaks to the church in Galatia, in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 7. And he says, you were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion, Paul says, did not come from him who calls you. In other words, it didn't come from God. It didn't come from... Now, yeah, sure, they said it came from God. And yes, they said that it's the right thing to, to, to believe and to do. And they said it was truth. But Paul is clear that it did not come from God. It came from another source, right? And, and they, were, they were united in their common understanding and by their common love in Christ Jesus, they were already united in these things. A love for one another that they had was, was part of their unity that motivated them to do good and to treat each other well. But it's a love that was completely founded upon the love in which they had received from God. That they had received love from God. They received love through Christ Jesus. In which case, they are, that is the foundation of their Christian walk. And it's, it is shown through their action towards one another. And that's the unity in which they are to hold fast to and to maintain in Christ Jesus. Look at verse 6. He says, therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. <laughs> right? Just continue Continue running the race, continue walking the walk, continue moving forward in Christ Jesus. Having been, been firmly rooted and now being built up in Him and established in your faith just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. All right? He tells them, He tells them, stick with what you have. All right? He, he knows what they've been taught. Right? He knows what information they have received. He was involved in the, in the transfer of information for these brethren. He knows already. He knows what they have been taught was true. He knows how they responded to what they heard was good and it was right. He knows that they are in Christ Jesus. Right? And he knows what they were taught. He knows what they were received. He knows that through faith and obedience that that is that they believed that Jesus Christ was Lord and that he was the source of their salvation, that he was the source of all that is good, that, that being in Christ was it, that that was it, that once you are there, once you are in Christ Jesus, there is nothing else that you need from this life. Once you are in Christ Jesus, there is nothing else that you need you don't need a special knowledge. You don't need a, a special title. You don't need a, a ritual. You don't need to continue in these habits of the Jews or circumcision or any of that stuff. That once you're in Christ Jesus, you're in Christ Jesus. And that relationship to God is based on that fact. And you, brethren, ought to be overflowing with gratitude for the fact that God doesn't need you to earn that position. 
You should be overflowing with gratitude that God doesn't need you to try to decipher and figure out some secret special knowledge in order to gain access to his grace and his love. That God has freely given that to you. And by responding to that, you're in Christ Jesus. And that's what you need to know. And we ought to be overflowing with gratitude for what God has done for us through Christ. Look at verse 8. He says, See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the traditions of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. For in him, Paul says, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, and in him you have been made complete. And he is the head over all rule and authority. Paul says, don't let somebody kidnap you. Don't let them take you captive. Don't let them try to persuade you to go with them or persuade you to to be enslaved to them. Don't let them take you captive. And the word that Paul uses there does carry that idea of, of being kidnapped or the idea of plundering for the sake of, of taking away a catch as a prize. You know, that, that whole concept of being in captivity. And it's a pre-planned, it's a well-organized thing. It's not as if these people come in and accidentally do something. No, no, they're, they're purposing to take you away. Their desire is to take you captive. They want to persuade you. They, they have a good, well-organized three-point plan to come in and say, you know what, if we go and we tell them this, this, and this, oh, they're going to be right there with us, and we're going to be able to pull them away from Paul and away from the teachings of Jesus, and we're going to be able to bring them onto our side and join us in our movement over here. And so they have a persuasive way of of deceiving the brethren into thinking, and Paul says, it's empty. That's what he says. He says, you know what, it's empty, and it's deceptive. And it's this empty, deceptive philosophy that you need to watch out for and you need to be careful with as if, as if you need something else, right? That's the idea. As if you need something else. As if you need this new law. As if you need this new teaching. As if you need this new ritual. As if you need circumcision. As if you need any of these things to be complete. Paul says... That you are in Christ Jesus, and in Christ Jesus, you are complete. And whatever it is they want to add to that, you reject it, and you move away from it, and you don't allow it to persuade you into doing something. These traditions of men that they want you to get involved in. But you know, I I was thinking about the fact that although we may not have people, and maybe we do, but not not as much as they probably did, who want us to, you know, come in they come in here and they say, you know, if I if you have this knowledge or if you do this, you know, then you'll be complete in, in God. And we don't really have that, but but we don't need it, do we? Because we do a pretty good job of that ourselves, don't we? We we do a pretty good job of trying to add to Christ. To, to maintain our relationship to God. We try to add to, and we say, you know what, I need this, or I need that, or I need to be a better this, or a better that, or, or if only I had this, my relationship to God would be better. And we, we often, at our own destruction, we cease to simply rely on Jesus as being enough. All right? He's enough. We don't need all that. He is enough. And in fact, we don't have to be rich, right, to have a right relationship with God. We don't have to be wealthy. We don't have to have a good job. We don't have to have any of that stuff. We don't have to have a big house. We don't have to have a lot of friends. All we need to have a right relationship and be complete is Jesus. And if we have that, we have enough, Paul says. Don't listen to those empty philosophers. Don't listen to the deception. Don't listen to those persuasive arguments, whether they come from outside or whether they're coming from your own head. Don't listen to them because you have enough in Christ Jesus. Paul says in verse 11, he says, And in him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands and the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. 
Right? And if you think back to the old law, you would remember that circumcision was for the Jews. And it was a sign of the covenant that would say that these people belong to me. And in which case they were commanded that on the eighth day that all the males would be circumcised as part of that, that covenant assurance, that sign of the covenant. It was a mark. And Paul says, you don't need that. Right? And a lot of these were pagans. They had never experienced that before. And Paul says, you don't, you don't need that. Because if you're in Christ Jesus, you have been circumcised. Right? And it's not the removal of the flesh. That's not what Paul's talking about. But you have been sealed. You have been made complete. You have been given the mark of ownership that you belong to God because you are in Christ Jesus. Jesus, not because you had the skin removed, but because you are in Christ, that in Christ you have been circumcised. You belong to God. You have that relationship with God. Look at verse 12, right? And he said, this, this is when it took place. He brings them back to that moment in time that, you know, you remember this? You remember what you did when you heard the gospel and you heard about Jesus and you responded? This is what you did. And this is the moment that it all began for you. Verse 12, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead, when you were dead in your transgressions, the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions. The power of the resurrection working in us. Right? The power of the resurrection working in us. The same God who raised Jesus from the grave and brought him back to life is the same God that took you when you were dead. When you were dead in your transgressions. When you were dead in your sin. When you, when you still wore the fleshly body of corruption and death. That, that you buried that. You buried it with Jesus in baptism. And then God, through the same power that raised Jesus from the grave, raised you up out of the water and brought you back to life and brought you into a new life and put you in Jesus. And right, when you're in Jesus, what do you have? What do we have in Jesus? Everything, right? We have everything. And, and Paul is pointing back and he said, when you responded to the good news that that's what happened. And here you are. And don't let somebody come in and tell you that you need Jesus plus. Because that's a lie. And it's wrong. But you have been buried with Christ. You came out of the water alive in Christ. You came out of the water forgiven in Christ Jesus. You're no longer wearing the body that is subject to death and decay. But you have been clothed in Christ Jesus. You are now in Him. Right? God, God chose that did he? I mean, I think it's I think it's very appropriate. You know, you, you think about throughout time, we think about Israel passing through the Red Sea and entering into a covenant relationship with God and and us passing through the water and the symbolism of, of a death and a burial and a resurrection. It's very fitting. But that's what God chose. That's what God chose as the medium to bring us into Christ Jesus, that through the water by faith. We would enter into a covenant relationship with God. And it's an act of faith, isn't it? It's an act of obedience, but it's an act of faith. And all too often I hear people say, you're trying to add that to to God's plan. They're like, I'm not trying to add anything to God's plan. And they say, what you're trying to say is Christ plus baptism. No, not at all. Right? I mean, immersed in water has absolutely no value without these words that tell us we're supposed to, right? Being baptized has absolutely no value without Jesus and the death and the burial and the resurrection and Jesus and the power of God to raise us from the dead. In other words, it would be an empty, deceptive ritual. It would be nothing. But, but because God says, this is how I want you to respond, we do. And Paul says, when we did that, if we, we acted out of faith, that we acted out of obedience, that in that, God chose to raise us up to life and that the old body of sin would be done away with and the new body that belongs to Jesus is now here, that you 
were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, a circumcision of Christ, that you were forgiven of your sins, that you are now in Jesus, and in Jesus you are complete. And what a beautiful thing that is, isn't it? Because otherwise we'd always be guessing. And I don't like to guess about things like this. I don't like to wake up in the middle of the night and think, oh man, I don't know if I'm saved or not. Don't you hate that? You ever been there? You ever, you ever been to a point in your life where you wake up in the middle of the night and you're scared and you think, I don't know. But Paul says to the brethren in Colossae, and he's saying to us, you know, all right? Your information was correct. Your source was correct. It came from the Holy Spirit through the apostles. You responded accordingly to the will of God. And now you're in. You know. Don't let anyone take you captive. Don't let anyone deceive you and trick you into doing something else. Verse 14. Oh, excuse me. Am I on verse 14? No, I missed it. Missed verse 14, but we're going to read it anyway. If you have your Bibles, you can look at it. It says in verse 14, "...having having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, he's taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made public display of them, having triumphed over them through him." We, we were all in debt, all right? Jews, Gentiles alike. The difference is the Jews knew they were in debt because they had the law to, to lay it out for them and say, hey guys, look at this. You know, I mean, there's a lot against you. The, the pagans were indebted to God because they had sinned and they came to the realization of their sin. Either way, they were all in debt to sin. And we all know it, right? We all knew that we were. But, but neither the Jew nor the Gentile had the means to repay that debt. Neither the Jew nor the Gentile had the ability to, to have that debt removed. Right? The, the Gentile couldn't just be a really good person and then God would say, man, that's a really good guy. I'm going to take his sins away. I'm going to forgive his debt. And the Jew could not be a perfect, obedient person towards the law and expect to receive that forgiveness. God wouldn't look at him and say, man, that is a really, really obedient Jew. I mean, he is good. I'm going to cancel his debt. I'm going to forgive him. It's not how it works. But Paul says, it's not through the law, and it's not through works of, of good deeds. It's not, it's not any of those things. But it is an act of faith that brings you into Jesus. It is complete trust in Jesus' ability to make you whole again. And that's where we need to rest our faith. And, and Paul says that whatever this is, that the certificate of debt, whether it's sin itself, whether it's the law, whatever it might be, Paul says, don't worry. Jesus nailed it to the cross. He did away with it. He nailed it to the cross. He's taken it out of the way. He has disarmed any ruler, any authority, any power that was against you. Jesus has disarmed, having nailed it to the cross. He made a mockery out of all of it. Having gone to death and experienced death and have been made a victor as as God brought him back from the dead, defeating all the enemies of God. So Paul gives them a warning in verse 18, a little bit further down. He says, let no one keep defrauding you of your prize. Right? Don't let anybody do that. Don't let the newest, best thing come along and defraud you of your prize. Don't, don't let some other religion that has developed over time defraud you of your prize. Don't let traditions, don't let these behaviors, don't let somebody come in and tell you something different than what the Spirit has already communicated to us come in and defraud you of your prize. Don't let anyone or anything take away what you are a recipient of. Right? Don't, don't even let your own thinking, okay? Right? That's our biggest enemy sometimes. Don't let your own thinking take away what God has given you. Don't let the pursuit of completeness and fullness in, in your life, whatever it is that you put in that, that blank space that you're pursuing, that you believe will make you complete, don't let that take you away from receiving the prize that God has in store for you in Christ Jesus. Whatever it is, 
Just refuse it. Don't follow it. Don't listen to it. Don't allow it to control you. Don't allow it to influence you. Don't allow it to determine what decisions you may make. But realize the fullness you have in Christ. Don't let it enslave you. Don't let it keep you from living the resurrected life that God has for you in Christ Jesus. That only comes, that only comes in Christ Jesus. Right? Completeness. Completeness can only be found in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Right? It, it, if, you, if you are one of those this, this evening, this morning, who have been baptized into Jesus, and you've been buried, and you buried that old man of sin, guess what? God raised you up again. It took a lot of faith. It took a lot of commitment. Just as much as it did Jesus when he allowed himself to be crucified, he believed that his father would raise him up. That took a lot of faith. That took a lot of commitment, a lot of trust. We too, when we are immersed in water, we, we have a tremendous amount of faith that, that God will do what he has promised to do and that in Jesus we will have everything that we need to be complete for God, for our future, right? And, and it's such a beautiful thing that we do. And if you've done that, have full confidence, have full assurance in your salvation. Don't wake up in the middle of the night and doubt. Don't be worried. Don't be concerned. Don't let that take your joy away. But rejoice and be grateful in the salvation that you have in Jesus. Or maybe you haven't made that commitment. Maybe, maybe you've been told something entirely different. And somebody said, you know, if you do this, you'll be saved. You've, we've heard those before. If you do that, if you do this, if you think this, if you believe this, don't let that Take away what God has in store for you in Christ Jesus. If you've been at this for a while and need prayers from the congregation, we're here for you. If, if you want to begin this journey, right now is a great opportunity to be immersed, to be baptized into Christ, and begin the journey of completeness. Whatever your need might be, if you would come forward as we stand and as we sing.